Hi everyone, today we're going to be continuing on our process thinking about thinking. And we're going to talk today about Ernst Mach's thought experiments. Ernst Mach was an Austrian scientist from the late 1800s, and he was a physicist who not only did a lot of research into shockwave theory and the physics of sound and optics, but he also was a philosopher, and he thought a lot about the science of thinking and how our thought processes can impact our capability of doing experimental design. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to reflect on different styles of approaching problem solving using convergent and divergent thinking. We will switch to different thought experiment methods you, to approach problem solving from different perspectives, and we'll work together imagining an experimental design using a basic thought experiment. So Ernst Mach, as I mentioned, was an Austrian scientist, and he did his PhD in physics and uh, did most of his work in shockwave theory. And you might recognize his name because they named the Mach principle for beating the sound barrier and the shockwave that ensues from breaking the sound barrier after Ernst Mach. So one great quote that he had from one of his uh, writings, Knowledge and Errors, Sketches Toward a Psychology of Scientific Research, the principal effort that leads to the discovery of new knowledge is due to abstraction and imagination. Hey, we're looking at some themes here about imagination and um, creative thinking. So as, uh, as a scientist, he really understood that science is a fundamentally creative endeavor that is balanced between the collection of facts and figures alongside a very creative ideation-based approach. So as you've discussed before, oftentimes science is viewed as a convergent thought process where individuals are focused solely on facts and figures. Convergence implies that there is a movement towards a singularity of what is possible, but in reality science is an incredibly divergent process where you're exploring a wide variety of different hypotheses and you are exploring all sorts of possibilities, making connections between a wide variety of different elements. And so it's really important to think of both components in science and divergence. The ability to have a creative and open-ended mindset needs to be balanced with the convergence together. So again, convergent thinking is focusing on a singular answer, such as solving, solving a math problem, doing a chemical formulation, spelling and grammar. These, these are sorts of things where there's one way to do it. And it's very practical and very good to think that way. Science is often thought of as convergent. However, it really is a oscillation back and forth between convergence and divergence. So divergent thinking is all about multiple ways to get to that solution. Brainstorming ideas, problem solving, creative writing, product development, project management, where there's a wide variety of different strategies and solutions. Um, and again, science has that oscillation back and forth between divergence and convergence in order for it to really be able to have the element of discovery that's necessary. So Ernst Mach was the first person to write about thought experiments, but one of the most famous scientists to use thought experiments would be Albert Einstein. Now, we are food scientists, and it's... Sorry, my USB is making some funny noises here, but... Uh, Einstein was one of the very first... Let's start one more time. Ernst Mach was the first scientist to write about thought experiments and to use them with his students in his uh, teaching career. However, one of the most famous scientists to use thought experiments would be Albert Einstein. And Ernst Mach's um, thought experiments were extremely influential in developing the theory of relativity. One of the most famous thought experiments from Einstein was 
the idea of an elevator and a man falling inside an elevator. If that man is falling inside an elevator and under the, um, under the influence of gravity, the elevator and the man are going to fall together and that man falling in the elevator isn't going to feel any conceptual difference. However, if that man was to take stuff out of his pocket and try and throw it, the coins in his pocket will remain where they are because gravity is, um, I'm not a physicist, <laughs> gravity is influenced on the entire system and gravity is pulling everything at the same rate. And so you have to think about this, but the gravity pulling on that object is going to be relative to the entire system. The person inside that, if he was to take the coins from his pocket, those coins are not going to fall to the ground of the elevator. And then instead it's going to be in a free fall system. This, I'm not explaining this really well. Again, I'm not a physicist, but Albert Einstein used that sense of let's imagine it in our minds and let's think it through and what all of the different possibilities are and all of the different influences, all the different variables, and think through all of those elements when describing the system. I mentioned in a different video that Thought experiments are useful not only because you can think through and test your hypothesis and think through what would be the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, like what would happen if it, if it was to happen the way you think, and what would be the alternative hypothesis, what would be the way it would happen if it didn't turn out the way you expected. You can think it all through in your mind and help really refine what you need to do. Now, there are different types of thought experiments. Some of them are focused on prediction. What would happen if you did this in your experiment? So um, if you were to put this chemical or apply this treatment, what would happen if you were to do that? These are the sorts of questions that you're going to be asking. There could be counterfactual. What would happen if you didn't do these things? And so if you didn't put in a certain chemical or you didn't do a certain treatment. Semi-factual is where you're focusing on all those different outcomes. What or could the outcome that you observe have occurred for a variety of different reasons? Hindcasting is where you're looking backwards. What could we have done differently in the past to change how things are currently? And retrodiction and backcasting are where you walk through sequentially backwards to figure out where where in the steps of things that you did, the outcome was changed. So there's some slightly different techniques involved, but uh, I, my outcome for this is that you're aware that there's different styles of questions that are commonly used in thought experiments. When I was making up this list and reviewing the notes about Ernst Mach and the different styles of thought experiment that he used, I kept thinking about the types of questions that I'm asking in the product development class. So I often go in and ask sort of these hypothesis type questions. What would happen if you put this ingredient into your next version of this product? And I want to see if the students can conceptualize. Yes, it's going to thicken up. Yes, it's going to have extended shelf life. Yes, it's going to have better functionality. Likewise, oftentimes I ask counterfactual question. What would happen if you didn't mix this or you didn't filter or you didn't cook it. These are common questions as well. That semi-factual, that two different reasons or multiple different reasons is reasonably common. Hindcasting, oh, hindcasting and backcasting are so common because oftentimes students walk in and they're like, this isn't what I expected. They got their alternative hypothesis when they developed their, when they developed their plan for the day. And I will often do walking through sequentially, what were the steps that you did to get to this point. And oftentimes, conceptually, in our minds, we are able to find where the error happened so that moving forward into the next experimental plan, you know exactly how you're going to structure it to minimize the um, negative impact that was observed in the previous experiment. So different types of thought experiment, different types of core questions that lead to that hypothesis building. 
So let's just imagine a, another thought experiment here, a food science related one and a really silly one at that. But what happens if we were to stick a piece of bread into the oven? Does the bread vanish? Does the bread turn into crumbs? Does the bread, what, what happens? This is where when we're doing thought experiments, we're pulling in on our preconceived ideas and the experience, the wisdom, the education and knowledge that we have about bread and application of heat from an oven and the different chemical impacts that are occurring. And well, we kind of know what's going to happen. That bread is going to go from being a pale white color to being a dark golden color with Millard browning and caramelization occurring with the carbohydrates and potentially if there's sugar in that formulation, some uh, caramelization, uh, carbohydrates and proteins forming Millard products, the moisture content is going to decrease as well. And so it's going to go from being soft and malleable into a crispy, um, crunchy texture. And the temperature is going to be higher so that it will be um, amenable for spreading nice things like butter or uh, jelly. I'm just thinking of toast. <laughs> so we can we can anticipate based off of our prior knowledge what is going to happen in this experiment. Now, what would what what would we say if we were to stick that piece of bread into the oven and for some reason it just stayed there like a white piece of bread? We could go into using some of those hind casting and back casting questions. Was the oven functioning properly? Did the heat that was applied in this um, oven actually interact with the bread? Was the bread somehow insulated from the heat? Were there other things impeding access of the radiant heat from the heating element? Another question that you could be asking is, what is this bread made out of? Is it a classic bread made out of a carbohydrate matrix such as um, wheat flour with perhaps some sugar and yeast? Or is this bread perhaps made out of a different matrix that doesn't have the capability of going through millet browning? Maybe it's made out of cauliflower or uh, foamed polystyrene for all that has mattered. Um, if it does not have the capability of going through millet browning, then why should it toast? I've, I've, I've for example, seen this where um, years back, Companies wanted to formulate products with fructose. Why? To reduce the sugar content because fructose has a higher sweetening power than uh, glucose or sucrose gram for gram. And so they could use slightly less sucrose or slightly less fructose, but get the same sweetening. However, fructose does not participate in Miller browning and is non-reducing sugar and therefore it never browned. And so You've got to ask a lot of questions and imagine in your head what is going on to think about deliberately what's going to happen. So if I'm doing a forecasting model with that bread, if I'm formulating bread with fructose, I may not get the same browning capability in that bread product. If I don't have carbohydrates in that bread, I'm not going to get Millard product. I'm not going to get caramelization. So there's a lot of imagination that goes on. And it's a lot of fun to just sit and hypothesize. Um, back when I did my PhD, I had a, a supervisor. His name was Paul Scott, and he was a, a research scientist at the um, United States Department of Agriculture in the Agricultural Research Service. And he always said to us, do a thought experiment because thinking is cheap. Doing stuff is expensive. <laughs> and he was right. Um, besides the fact that there's a long history of the success of using thought experiments, he's absolutely right. Thinking is very cost effective and the more you think, the better you'll get at it. The more you think too, um, these thought experiments, we're going to come back and revisit them as we get into some of our work in root cause analysis, because these same skills of imagination and thinking through cause and effect will really help us later on when we're doing more work with food safety management and quality assurance uh, because we're really thinking through with our imagination what are all the possible causes to 
see the outcomes that we're looking for. So we've done some thought experiments and again, I'm going to encourage you as you're going about doing experimental design and problem solving to really think through with your imagination, what are the possibilities of what you could be doing and what would be the different cause and effect that you would see, do it in your mind before you plan it out and then do the actual experiment. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.